the gospel as it's set out for us in scripture has much to tell us concerning a Christian's conduct and character. That is, how should the Christian live? And scripture does that by giving us examples time and time again of saints who lived for Christ. It also does it by giving us sort of maxims or injunctions or commands or imperatives or encouragements guiding us as to how we should conduct ourselves. Now, many of those encouragements and commands seem almost highly idealistic, almost unattainable. For instance, Paul writing to the church in one of his letters to the church in Thessalonica said in one verse, rejoice always. In the following verse, he says, pray continually. In the next verse, he says, give thanks in all circumstances. Three verses. Can we attain any of those? And you might say, totally unattainable. Yet, as we read scripture, and as the spirit indwells in us, we realize that these are not just injunctions, commands, but encouragements for us. They are promises for us that we can do that in and through his power working within us. But then there are other kinds of encouragements that when we first hear them, they seem so counter to today's culture that our first reaction is to say, you cannot be serious. And it's one of those commands that I want to focus your attention on this morning. The command to humble ourselves. It doesn't strike as if it's real. Today, whether you're in management, whether you're in business, whether you're in sport, whether you're in education, perhaps even in the church, any sign of humility is looked down upon. Leadership is power, control, authority, superior knowledge. It doesn't ring true. That's not the way we are. And then there's a second reason why we think this is just not the way it is today. Because we are told that one's self-worth is very important. Our happiness depends upon how we view ourselves. A low sense of self-worth, and we go around looking miserable. A big sense of self-worth, and we happily go singing around. And yet scripture says, humble yourselves. So, Just as when John McEnroy, for a tennis fan years and years ago, when the ball went out according to him, or when the ball was inside the line according to him and the umpire ruled otherwise, John McEnroe simply said, you cannot be serious. This is not the way it is. This is not reality. And yet, this doctrine, humble yourselves, is vital you might say, well, we better check that this is not just something that one author in Scripture said once and in only in saying so in passing. So is it really something that runs through Scripture? Well, let me try and demonstrate that to you by quoting some verses drawn from the Old Testament and the New Testament. In Psalms we read, He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them His ways. <laughs> Micah says, to what does the Lord, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your Lord. Proverbs, and this is something that we can take almost as a definition of humility. Proverbs says, humility is the reverent fear of the Lord. There's a spiritual dimension dimension to humble yourselves. Humility is that unlimited, unbounded awe of what the Lord has done for us. But that's just the Old Testament. Let's move to the New Testament. Christ speaking to all of his disciples says, the greatest among you will be your servant, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Paul, writing to the Colossians, says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, 
humility, gentleness, and patience. And he has much the same when he's writing letters to the Galatians, to the Colossians, and to the Romans. And then there's James. James, ever practical, says, humble yourselves before the Lord. So I think these verses tell us that, yes, it is a constant refrain of Scripture, this command to humble ourselves. And humility is something that's expected of somebody who is following the Lord, clothing ourselves in humility. And that it is most decidedly spiritual in character. And this should not come as a surprise to Christians that what Scripture teaches us, what the Lord wants of us, differs from the view that the world has of that same topic. And we'll come across that time and time again. Perhaps I can just mention in passing here that in these verses that I've quoted, there's no hint of self-deprecation associated with Christian humility. There's no hint of being timorous, being fearful, of being uh, taken aback by the surroundings that we find ourselves in and servile because of it. So this, if in fact then humility is so central to the gospel and so counterculture, then we can ask ourselves several questions. First of all, to whom does this command apply? Everybody? Christians? Some Christians? Or some Christians who desperately are in need of a dose of humility? And we can ask, well, what does the command mean? What does it actually mean to humble ourselves? And how is it achieved? Is it really some different kind of humility? And is it attained differently? And then we can ask, what's the outcome of obeying this command? What does being clothed with humility actually look like? And how are we, how are we to pursue it? So these are the questions that I want to pursue with you this morning. And I want to do that by looking at one passage from the first letter of Peter, chapter 5. And if you want to turn to it in the Bibles in the pew in front of you, then, and if the Bible is the ESV, which it usually is, you'll find the reading on page 1222. Like a telephone number, but very useful telephone numbers, because they tell us who to be in contact with. And here's a number for you to remember. 122. 122. Three twos. 1222. Two, two. So I'm going to start my reading in a little while at verse 5, but I'm going to start in an unusual place, in the middle of verse 5. And as you look for the scripture reading, let me tell you something about <clears throat> the, the letter in, in itself and the context in which this reading occurs. The author is the Apostle Peter, fiery, fearless, boundless charisma, absolutely born leader, not the kind of person that you would in this world associate it with being humble. Where is it written from? <clears throat> Rome, the center of the world at this stage. This is not the place where you teach a doctrine of humility. Who does, it, who does he write to? He writes to all of the people living in what is present-day Turkey on the borders with the, the Black Sea, to congregations, to individuals, to families, to parents, to uh, husbands, to wives, to the elders of the church, to the young in the church. He has a message for each and every one of those somewhere in this, pass in this letter. And there's one thing that I have to point out to you as well, because it strikes me the minute I pick up one Peter. Here is somebody who the authorities in Jerusalem looked down upon because he had such a coarse accent. Now listen to the way he starts the letter. This is not our reading, but it's a taste of how he writes. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. This is an uneducated man. 
But even in translation in English or check it out in German or check it out in Welsh, if that's your first language, this is exquisite prose. But the meaning of what he says is far and above all of that. And his purpose in writing this is twofold. It's to encourage the people who were suffering in various, under various circumstances and encourage them by reminding them of the joy that they had in Christ. And the hope, hope is something that he mentions several times. <clears throat> so he wants to encourage the recipients of the letter, but he also wants to guide them. And so these two things we'll, we'll see later on become very for, uh, important. So having written to each and every uh, grouping within the church, the church itself, the uh, the individuals in the church, the congregation, the elders, the um, the family, the husbands or wives, the young people, and so on. He now, in the middle of verse five, turns to everybody. He returns. This is his last message. This is the only thing left that he wants to say. So, in the middle of verse five, we find the following: Clothe yourselves all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then in verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Now, I'm going to devote the, the rest of the message this morning to those verses. But to get a further taste of what Peter is driving at. Let me continue the reading. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, he's just told them to be humble, but listen to what he's now telling them. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after a while, after you've suffered, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then he signs off with a reference to his colleagues. So back to our questions. First question, to whom does this imperative humble yourselves apply? Who's it relevant for? When we look at the scripture readings, the quotations that I uh, referred to earlier, there was no hint that this was a non-inclusive. When Christ spoke to his disciples, he spoke to all of them and said, humble yourselves. When Paul wrote to the Colossians, to the Galatians, to the Thessalonians. He didn't say, hey, some of you sitting over on the right-hand side of the church, you better humble them. No, no, he wrote to everybody. So did James. And so now we find in Peter. He says, clothe yourselves, all of you, without exception, no exception. Now, this isn't the way the world looks at it. Because we tend to think that somebody who's born to a certain role, he is a, he's a, a king or a queen, he has a royal blood, or somebody who is president or prime minister or whatever, somehow or other, they don't need to humble themselves. Maybe that was the view some years ago. We seem to have changed since now. Now we think of people who are brilliant in business, are leading bankers who in, enable you to earn enormous amount of money on your investments, or they're brilliant teachers, or they're fantastic poets, or they have some special abilities. They don't need to humble themselves, surely. But Scripture says, whoever you are. And then there may be some of you here sitting in the congregation, looking to your left and to your right, and you say, look, in all being totally objective now, really compared with the people around me, in the church, or in the office, or on the sports field, or in my social acquaintances, Compared with all of those, I really am less in need of humbling myself than those people. Scripture says, no, no, you too, you too. And then there are others, and here we, we'll speak for the others. The weak will, the, the people who seem to be 
perennially meek, the people who are easy pushovers, surely, surely they don't need to humble themselves. What they need is the antidote of humility. But it's not true. Scripture says everybody. So this applies to you and to me, whoever we are. And so we can come to our next question, and that is to say, what, and we're now in verse 6, and we look at the first part of it. What does humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God actually mean? And how is it achieved? What, 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 what is it? Is it something that's so very different? Well, let me point out to you that this command, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, comes in two parts. There's the therefore, and then humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Some of you can cast your minds back to school when you were doing geometry or algebra and you came across the idea of a proof and you said, angle A equals angle B. And then the next line was, angle B equals angle C. And then those famous three dots, meaning therefore, said, therefore, angle A equals angle C. In the light of what has gone before, It then follows that. And that's exactly what Peter is implying here. Therefore, he says, in the light of everything that I've written in this letter, now that I'm coming to the end, this is what follows. In the light of what I've told you, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. So that therefore is there for us to look to see why it is there. And if we look back, I said earlier that... Uh, Peter had two objectives, to encourage them with a, so that they could rejoice in the living hope and to instruct them. So let me, simply for your benefit, mention some of the th- encouragements that Peter has given to the Christians in the northern part of Turkey in terms of who they are and what they possess He's written to them and told them, you have a new life, a living hope, an an inheritance that is unperishable, undefiled, and unfading. He's told them, you believe in Jesus Christ and that you can rejoice with inexpressible joy filled with glory because of your, your faith and your hope are in him, the Lord of all. All of that in the first two or three verses of of Peter. And then he goes on and tells them later, You are being built up to be acceptable to God. You are undergoing this process of unimaginable beauty, of being sanctified, of being made acceptable to God. It's not something that happened to you yesterday, or it's something that will happen to you the day after tomorrow. It's something that is continuous once you become a Christian. You are being made acceptable unto God by a process of sanctification. And what's one of the most important steps in that? Why? It's to humble yourselves, as we shall see in a minute. And then Peter goes on and tells them, you're a citizen of God's kingdom. One of his people granted a passport through his grace and mercy. And because you're a citizen of his kingdom, you are free. You have freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is there, the the soul is free. And he goes on also to tell them that you're going to suffer for Christ. He who bore your sins on the cross, you too are going to suffer. But, as we've just read, after the suffering, you're going to be restored and confirmed and strengthened and established. And you're going to learn to serve others as good stewards of God's grace. These are gifts given to the people and Peter is reminding them that this is what is theirs in the Lord Jesus Christ. But also he tells them he wants to guide them and lead them and tell them and support them and inform them of what kind of lives they should lead. And so as you go through the letter, you find that he's telling Christians that you have to be obedient, you have to recognize his will, you have to respond in adversity in his grace, you've got to be sober-minded, you've got to prepare your minds, you're not to be conformist, you're not to conform to the humble humbleness of this world. The humbleness of this world, you might say, one of you might be the best chess 
um, chess player in the world. And then you're saying, how can I be humble? Everybody knows that I'm the best chess player in the world. But scripture and Peter tells us here, rather than being conformed, your object is to seek to be holy. And you're to put away malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, all of this in one letter. And of course, you go to grow your lives, grow into your salvation. So Peter has pointed, painted this word picture for us based upon God's glory and grace and Christ's love and sacrifice. And we see that when Peter, when Paul is writing to the Philippians, he says this of Jesus Christ. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, as we've sung so very tellingly earlier in the service. So here we have the creator and the sustainer of the world, humbling himself, taking on the form of a servant and suffering to the extent of his death on the cross. His love and his sacrifice for us. And it is because of that that Peter can tell people, humble yourselves. The idea is that the Christian's humility is born from, comes from, focusing on him, appreciating him, thanking him, worshipping him, and yielding in humble obedience to his will. That's Christian humility. Bowing the knee before the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Queen of England wants to make somebody a sir, the person walks in from a door on, the, on this side, comes and stands before her, kneels before her. She puts her sword on his right shoulder and his left shoulder and then says, arise, sir, whoever you are. That's Christian, a picture of Christian humility for us. We come before the Lord Jesus Christ and we kneel before him in humble obedience. That's Christian humility. And it's a humility that's born also from recognizing our total inadequacy to live a life worthy of him, to enable us to glorify him. It's as if the Queen of England goes down and picks the person up and says, you are now mine. And so we can go on. Because it doesn't only say, humble yourselves. It says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And throughout scripture, the phrase mighty hand of God refers to God as the provider and the deliverer. So on the one hand, we are bending the knee. And on the other hand, he provides and delivers for us. Yeah, One example of the expression, the mighty hand of God, the people of Israel, they've left Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land. It takes them it's seemingly forever, and now they've got one last obstacle. They've got the River Jordan to cross, and they have the ark. And how do you cross a river in those days with an ark? And opposition, perhaps, on the other side of the river. In the end, in humble obedience, they march to the river. The God of creation, the sustainer of the world, parts or stops the flow of the river for a while, They cross and the river flows again. Now, there may be human explanations for that, but the reality is that that is what happened at that particular time. And Joshua, thinking back and writing about that event, said of that event, so that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. Jim Elliott, the the missionary to the Orca Indians, made this statement. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And that is what happens to a Christian as he humbles himself before the Lord. He divests himself of that which is uh, 
pride and arrogance and takes on what is right and proper for him as a summer, as a humble servant. And that takes us to our next question. What is the outcome of obeying this command? What does being clothed in humility actually look like? Well, we've had all of these uh, specifics about being obedient, about being non-conformist, but being transformed, of serving and so on. But is there something that is overarching? Is there something that is general about humility and humbling ourselves before the mighty hand of God? And I would suggest to you that there is, and that it appears in this uh, passage of Scripture, because Peter uses the word, clothe yourselves. And this apparently, as a um, compound word, occurs only here in Scripture. And it refers to putting on an apron and tying it tightly around you. So as we become humble, the apron is to become a part of us. Now, Peter, we've been celebrating the Last Supper in remembrance of him. Peter was there at the Last Supper. What happened at the Last Supper? Well, do you remember? The disciples were seated around and Christ picked up an apron and washed the feet of the disciples. So the God of creation, the God who all holds everything together now, the God who went to the cross in, for love for us and in obedience to his Father, kneels and washes the feet of each and every one of his disciples. And then he says, I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Christ is our example when it comes to being clothed with humility. Paul, writing to the Romans, puts it very explicitly. He says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Or as the New International Version says, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, Christ himself says, take my yoke upon you. Put on my apron, the apron with which I wash the disciples' feet. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So being clothed with humility means nothing less than being Christ-like. Our goal is to glorify the Lord. How can you dress like somebody that you admire unless you know what that person wears? And the same is true in the Christian gospel. You cannot clothe yourselves. You cannot put on the Lord Jesus Christ unless you know what he is like, how he has revealed himself to us so that we can then grow in grace and knowledge. The world thinks of humility as divesting ourselves, stripping off that which uh, would reduce our stature. We reduce our natural characteristics, some of which may be helpful and useful, limiting ourselves and our actions. The Christian humility, being clothed in humility, is far from, is the opposite. It's the antithesis of taking things off. It's putting things on. It's putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, enhancing us, enabling us to strengthen our character and guide our, our character and guide our activities. Now you say, all this is very theoretical. Give me some examples. Well, let me give you some examples. They're, they're, they're limitless, but let me, let me give you some. I've quoted Paul very often in this passage. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says, you want me to boast? If I were boasting, I could tell you that my parentage was better than any of yours. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. You want me to boast? Let me tell you about my education, the best education the world could offer at that time. You want me to boast about my character, about my conduct? By the law of the Pharisees at that time, I'm blameless. I can look at all of you and challenge you. But then he goes on and he says this, all of that, all of that, 
I regard as garbage, rubbish, compared with the surpassing worth of knowing my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That chess player who's the best player in the world, it would, know, it would be an, an act of self, uh, of, of dishonest modesty to say that he was not. But it would be an act of Christian humility to say, compared with knowing Christ my Savior, that means nothing to me. It doesn't mean anything. We sang earlier on, there'll come a time when we are no longer here. Heaven and earth will disappear. But my humility before the Lord Jesus Christ will be honored for eternity. So that's one example. Let me give you another example. Leader in this church, not a pastor, leader of the uh, elders as it was then. Young man goes on to become the chief executive officer of a uh, renowned private bank. This private bank is so successful that when the crash came in 2008, 2009, people were running to this bank to invest in this bank because this bank would guarantee that their money was safe. No other bank at that time was prepared to do that unless the government said and came along and would support them. So he was the chief executive officer of this bank at this time. Where is he now? Go on the web. Look up Jeremy Marshall. You will find YouTubes facing death as someone suffering from incurable cancer. He was told years ago that he had a few months to live. But there he is. He's ministering in small churches and chapels and groups. He's ministering to ministers of the gospel. He's ministering to people in the Houses of Parliament, telling them, in this day and age, what you need is Christ. And he can say that. There's not a hair on his head. His eyes have suffered. He's almost gone blind. But he's witnessing. And what does he do in humility? Because he was the president of this bank. He gave all of that up. He cannot deny that. What does he do? He brings people to the foot of the cross and he says, I don't have an answer if you're suffering from cancer. I'm suffering too and I'm day by day I'm battling it. But at the foot of the cross, as I look at what Christ has done for me, I have peace and contentment that this world knows nothing of. Let me give you one more example. What? Now I have to choose, having said one more example. (laughs) Okay. Um, Here's a young man. He's just 30 years old. It's 1930. He couldn't serve in the First World War because he had a weak heart. Where is he in 1920? Sorry, where is he in 1920? He's in uh, the mountains of Sashan in western China, alone, traveling from one village to another, Nobody to support him. He's on his own, climbing mountains, witnessing for the Lord. That's not the end of his life. He goes on and he suffers and he goes through um, terrible periods where people are against him, although he has done nothing wrong. And what does this man do? There's no hint of a lack of radiance in him. We read the psalm earlier on, and if we had read it in another translation, we would have found the words... Look to him and be radiant. They're the most wonderful words you can come across. If you want an exercise in humility, look to him. And how is this man, how did this man who lived a long life, how did he survive such experiences? Well, we look at the hymn of his, a hymn where he says the following, if I can find it. Thou who wast rich beyond all splendor, All for love's sake became as poor. Thrones for a a manger did surrender. Then he goes on. Thou who art God beyond all praising, all for love's sake becamest man, stooping as low, but sinners raising heavenwards by thine eternal plan. Thou who art love beyond all telling, saviour and king, 
we worship thee, Emmanuel, within us dwelling. Make us what you would have us to be. Thou art love beyond all telling. So that gives you a taste of the fact, yes, this is something that is worth pursuing. Because as we humble ourselves, God himself raises up. God himself enables us to live that life of pure humility. Can I ask, where are you and I this morning in terms of our spiritual humility? In the end, we're one of two. We celebrated the Lord's Supper earlier on. That was followed very soon by Calvary. And on Calvary's hill, there were three crosses. Christ was on the middle cross, pierced by our sins onto that cross. And on either side of him were two criminals. And those two criminals, I ask you, are you which one this morning? Because one turns to Christ and says, taunting him, are you not the Christ? Save yourselves. Save yourself and and, and us too. The other one turns to, the second criminal turns to the first one and says, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and indeed we are justly for we are receiving the due rewards of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Two different responses to the same situation. And then this second criminal says something that is astounding and astonishing in the context of that situation. He is within a heartbeat of death. And he turns to Jesus, who's also within a heartbeat of death. And he says to him, why should he say this? He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He could have turned to Jesus and said, you're dying like me. But this man had known, had come to know that Jesus had committed no crime. And he humbly, he can't be on his knees, he's pierced to the cross. And Jesus turns to him and says to him and to everybody who follows him today, he says, you'll be with me in paradise. Now in a minute I'm going to ask you to turn uh, and sing our closing song. And it's a, a tune that I love but the words I love even more and so we might be carried away with the tune so let me tell you what the words are before we stand up to sing it meekness and majesty manhood and deity in perfect harmony the man who is God lord of eternity dwells in humanity kneels in humility and washes our feet. Oh, what a mystery, meekness and majesty. Bow down and worship, for this is your God. And he goes on, as you will, when you sing. Let's rise to sing.